Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Donovan. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. So I'm going to talk to you today about our work on uh, dairy products and uh, uh, incident type 2 diabetes. So the context, why am I interested in this? As a physician in diabetes, and my training both in diabetes and public health, I'm deeply interested in etiology. I want to understand why disease happens. And the context is that type 2 diabetes is um, high in prevalence, as this map, uh, many of you will be familiar, is from the International Diabetes Federation, Diabetes Atlas, of which I'm a member of that Atlas Committee. The prevalence of diabetes is high, and here's the US, of course. These hot spots with more than 20 million people with diabetes already in the world. And the sad or the depressing fact is that it seems to be unrelenting. The numbers are still going up. These are our latest estimates that be released at the end of uh, 2013, and the numbers estimated uh, of people with diabetes is going up uh, just in a matter of years, you can see there, from 382 million estimated to have diabetes to nearly 600 million people. This is serious stuff, and this is a burden to individuals, to their carers, and to society. And note here that no region of the world is exempt. So here's North America and the Caribbean and other areas of the world where the prevalence is set to rise or estimated to rise. So the search for solutions and modifiable factors is on. And uh, as part of that endeavor, you will be aware, I hope, of the uh, lifestyle intervention studies that provided pretty convincing and I would say unequivocal evidence that uh, lifestyle interventions of both diet and physical activity and together do have an impact on delaying the onset of diabetes or in, in preventing it completely. And this was a meta-analysis in the British Medical Journal by some colleagues of ours in Leicester. Uh, and they uh, meta-analyzed that the overall effect was a reduction by 50% by lifestyle intervention. So then it begs the question, if we know that lifestyles work, that better diets work, what's the big deal? Why don't we just go achieve this? And the point is, in free-living individuals outside of the clinical trials context, uh, it's a different story. So this was a review now 10 years ago by the World Health Organization. And note here, I do not want you to look for all the detail, but the point to note here is that if you look at the convincing evidence column, there is not one dietary factor that shows up in free-living individuals in the appraisal of evidence on factors that could be um, instrumental in the prevention of diabetes. So in the real world, we have an issue of what diets to recommend. Now, clearly, in the past 10 years, progress has been made, which is great, which is encouraging. And of particular interest, of course, is uh, dairy products, as we've been discussing all morning. And I will not go into any of this detail because we've had some excellent lectures already on why we might be interested in dairy products for chronic disease. And in this case, uh, I'm addressing type 2 diabetes. One that has not been referred to so very much so far, I will highlight, is the issue about the saturated fat, which is in dairy products. Is it somehow fundamentally different? The old uh, conventional notion of all saturated fat is bad, has adverse health effects. Does that hold for dairy fat? And that is a question, as Dr. Donovan said uh, in my introduction, uh, that I'm interested in biomarkers particularly. I'm investigating that with biomarkers of saturated fat intake currently, and we have just finished um, a very large study investigating exactly that. So my interest and our group's interest in, in, in this whole area was sparked off when uh, this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis was published by Elwood and colleagues uh, from Wales in uh, 2010. And what was interesting about this was that high-fat dairy was found not to be associated with risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and mortality. And what was even more is that for total dairy intake, which uh, they couldn't differentiate between the high and low fat, uh, there were inverse associations for each of these outcomes. So we wanted to take this further and uh, see if we could contribute further to the literature because at this point, the um, uh, number of studies in this review were few and it was 
at the very start of uh, beginning to appraise uh, this, this area of science. So our aim was to examine the association between both the amount and the type of dairy product intake and the risk of new onset or clinically incident uh, type 2 diabetes. We had two specific objectives. One was uh, to use heterogeneity of dietary exposure across different countries um, using conventional methods. Uh, and secondly, we also wanted to use more detailed dietary assessment methods, uh, in, in this case a food diary. And another thing in the kind introduction Dr. Donovan said uh, that is my interest is to endeavor to use more precise methods going beyond the food frequency questionnaire wherever possible, both in terms of self-report and in terms of biomarkers. So these were two linked objectives that we tried to address. So to address objective one, uh, this work is published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, just about 18 months ago or so. And uh, Yvonne Schlaus uh, was a PhD student then who came to work with me from Utrecht in the Netherlands, and now she's a postdoc. So uh, she did a fantastic piece of work here. Um, so for this work, we worked with the Interact study, which is a large study funded by the European Union under the framework 6, FP6. And the, for those who are interested in methods, we did publish the methods in Diabetologia. And this study is based within the um, European Prospective Investigation into Cancer uh, study, the EPIC study. And of the 10 countries that is uh, the EPIC Europe study, uh, Interact included eight of them, uh, including both northern countries all the way down to the south. The design we have used here is a nested case cohort study within EPIC Europe, and that is the name of the study EPIC Interact. Uh, therefore, this is a prospective study nested in a large prospective cohort. The distinguishing features are that it is large, it's about half a million people, of whom uh, 340,000 were eligible for this work by virtue of having um, blood samples available and detailed dietary information, because the purpose of Interact, as the name might be alluding to or suggesting there, is to study the interaction between lifestyles and genetic factors. So we did need the blood for the DNA, hence the eligible sample. We have long follow-up of nearly 12 years. We had nearly 4 million person years of follow-up. And we assembled what we believe is the world's largest data set of incident cases of type 2 diabetes. So these are people who at baseline did not have diabetes, they did not have prevalent diabetes, and we followed them forward in time. Um, so here we have exposure heterogeneity by virtue of these different countries across Europe. So drilling down into the method of the study, if you imagine this bigger circle as the entire cohort that had the eligible sample of 340,000 people, from that we selected, uh, not selected, we ascertained uh, type 2 incident diabetes cases in the entire cohort. So that is all the cases occurring and verified as well. So unless a case that we ascertained was verified by external information, we did not count it as a case of diabetes. We then selected a sub-cohort which effectively serves as a control group. Um, our exposure, of course, is dairy product intake. And here are some uh, important uh, bits of information. We used a case cohort uh, analysis which was suitable for the case cohort design because you will note that there's a small number of cases that appear in the sub-cohort, but that is by design because it's totally random. So it also brings in some future incident cases, just a small number. We used the residual method where we uh, adjusted the uh, dairy intake for energy intake, but we also ran a standard multivariable model. Uh, we did a random effects meta-analysis across, across the eight countries, and we adjusted the analysis for a range of potential important confounding factors, an issue, as you know, that was discussed earlier in one of the talks. We also did a range of sensitivity analyses and robustness analyses to test out whether our findings were, were uh, stood up to uh, further challenges. So on to the results. Um, we set out to look for heterogeneity in exposure, and we got it. So this is uh, data in men and in women. And what this shows is that across the countries of Europe, spelled out here, there are wide variations in the types of dairy product intakes. So in the UK, milk intake is high, for example, in men and women. In France, no surprises, 
the intake of yo uh, yogurt and cheese intake is high, and other variations to go with it. Okay, so on to the main results. So these are forest plots that show the results for the association between total dairy products and the risk of incident diabetes by each country and then pooled across the entire sample. And note that these comparisons are for the highest fifth of intake versus the lowest fifth of intake, but we've also examined p-values for trend, and we've also done those response analyses in a separate approach. You will note that our model presented here is our, uh, if you like, the uh, maximally adjusted model, which includes uh, a whole host of factors that are considered relevant to this association because they may distort the findings. And as well as the standard things you would expect in terms of risk factors for diabetes, we have also included a range of dietary factors. And in the sensitivity analysis, we had even further dietary factors, including, for instance, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, which are known to be related with diabetes and certain other factors too. So what this shows is that um, in the pool sample, there was a null association between total dairy products intake and, and uh, incident diabetes. Moving on to milk intake, we also found an overall null association. There is a hint that there's a slight increase uh, of 10%, but of course that is uh, a, a, a sort of false perception in the sense that the 95% confidence intervals, intervals do overlap unity, and therefore that's a null association for milk intake. We examined uh, yogurt and thick fermented milk intake together because in this study we were unable to separate the two because of the high thick fermented milk intake, particularly in places like the Netherlands. And overall, while there was a tendency towards uh, a reduced risk, it was just overlapping unity, so it was not significant. Cheese intake was an interesting one where there was a 12% reduction in diabetes incidence uh, the P for trend across the quintiles of intake was significant, but in the overall uh, Q5 to Q5 comparison, this was not significant. However, a priori, when we also looked at the combined fermented dairy products intake, now we combine yogurt, cheese, and thick fermented milk, we found a significant uh, uh, association in the inverse direction with a 12% reduced uh, risk of incident diabetes here. In this work, we were unable to separate out uh, high-fat and low-fat intakes because of the nature of how the data were collected with dietary questionnaires, food frequency questionnaires. In, in these studies did not permit us to do that. So c conclusions from this objective, from the first uh, piece of work, acknowledging the strengths and limitations, which I don't have time to go into, but very happy to discuss. There was no association for total dairy product intake, but there was an inverse association for fermented dairy products. And we felt that this deserved further interrogation, and hence why we moved into our second objective. For this, I'm grateful to Laura O'Connor, who's my uh, postdoctoral fellow, who worked on this study in now the EPIC Norfolk study, which is again part of the same study, but in the UK component of the EPIC Europe study, we have uh, collected much more detailed uh, dietary data, which I will show you in a minute. So here we have uh, used the food diary, and this was a prospective food diary which collected information on habitual uh, diets uh, in dynamic time recording for seven days. Um, you're not meant to be able to see the detail there, but I think you'll get the idea that uh, as opposed to a food frequency questionnaire where you have the pre-specified lists and people only tick boxes, they cannot give you any detail. In the diary, we have specific information on uh, the amounts, the portion sizes, uh, the brand names, the type of food they ate, uh, even if it's tea or coffee where the milk was added and so on. So very detailed information and we can differentiate between specific subtypes. So following a similar design as in the larger study that I showed you, this was a smaller study, but this is a trade-off between detail of information and uh, the size of the study. So here, again, similarly, we have incident type 2 cases ascertained, which were also verified. And we ended up with just under 800 um, cases uh, and 4,000 sub-cohort. And taking a similar approach, we applied a Cox regression with the uh, specific uh, design for, for the uh, case cohort study, 
we use the residual method, but we also repeat it with the standard multivariable method and similar approach to confounding and to um, sensitivity analyses. So on to some results. It's a bit of a busy slide. I want you to only focus on the black uh, lines, not the grayed out lines, only to say that they just show across thirds of the distribution of dairy intake, they show the amounts uh, of, of intake, the range of intake. So we're not going to focus on those. For total dairy intake, there was a null association with incident diabetes. And when we looked at high fat and low fat dairy intake, now here we were able to uh, get great granularity in our data by defining the cutoff of high fat and low fat uh, at a threshold of 3.9% uh, of fat content of whole milk, which is the content of fat in whole milk in the UK. So we use that threshold of 3.9% to d distinguish between high fat and low fat dairy. And for either of these, we did not see um, a significant association in this more adjusted model. For the low-fat dairy, there was an association in model one, which was less adjusted, but clearly confounding was playing a part. So on to subtypes of dairy intake. Again, please focus not on the gray, but only on the black. And for milk intake, we saw an overall uh, null association this really jumped out at us though, yogurt intake, we found quite a substantial decreased risk association. We have a hazard ratio of 0.72, which shows a 28% reduction in the incidence of diabetes here. And there was a significant uh, trend across the tertiles. Uh, for cheese intake, it was uh, non-significant. Uh, for total fermented dairy product intake, similarly non-significant, but here's the result for low-fat fermented dairy products, a 24% reduction in the hazard of diabetes. At this point, I should add that yogurt intake contributed to uh, some 87% of the low-fat fermented dairy products. So in this population, in the UK, uh, in the 90s, which is when the baseline of this data collection was, all the yogurt uh, fell into the low-fat fermented dairy product category. So our conclusions from this, again, acknowledging the strengths and limitations. Uh, I'd like to think we have more strengths than limitations, but as always, there are limitations. Uh, we found that low-fat fermented dairy product, in particular yogurt intake, was associated with a decreased risk of diabetes. Other dairy types were not associated. And Translating this into uh, a sellable message, if you like, or a public health message, we worked out that in the UK, looking at the uh, serving size or the pot size in the UK of 125 grams, I looked this up to ma make it US relevant. I think that's just over four ounces, I believe. Uh, about four and a half of these per week uh, basically equated to that uh, risk reduction that I just showed you on the previous slide. So to put this into context, what have others shown? So this was what started us off into this uh, research area when we saw this. At that point, this was based on five studies and around 7,000 type 2 diabetes cases. Since then, there have been three other systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And uh, as you can see, the numbers have been increasing. Uh, this study had about double the number of type 2 cases. They didn't report it, but if you count it up, that's about 13 to 14,000 cases. And what's remarkable is that across all of these systematic reviews, there is a uncannily similar risk reduction for total dairy products, which is interesting that it's picked up on meta-analyses, but not on uh, when individual studies are examined. Um, the key findings for subtypes, this one did not look uh, examine uh, subtypes, uh, but each of these other three have shown, again, a consistency of finding, which is very reassuring. So in this uh, review, uh, low-fat dairy and yogurt intakes were associated inversely. In uh, this one by Gao et al., again, low-fat dairy, cheese, and yogurt were associated inversely. And in this latest one, uh, low-fat dairy and cheese were, so fermented dairy products were associated. And our work from Interact was included in these two latter ones here. So I'd like to end by uh, offering you an interpretation of these findings. Um, we believe that this shows that dairy products do have a role in the prevention of diabetes. Uh, there are specifically important inverse associations for low-fat fermented dairy products, and yogurt is a key contributor to this inverse association.
we know that nutritional epidemiology has limitations, but the findings are robust and strong in different settings and with different methods. The we know that also association is not the same as causality, but uh, trials of diets I would offer to you are not feasible for hard health endpoints. Yes, sure, one can study intermediate endpoints, but you're not going to put people on different diets and wait X years till they develop some chronic illness. And we have to rely on other criteria. There's a whole set, uh, set of criteria, including the credibility and the robustness of findings. Um, one caveat, which I'd like to repeat from the talk of Professor Tremblay earlier, is dairy products should be considered with an overall healthy diet. It's not a magic bullet on its own. Because some of the headlines we got from our research were, uh, you know, if uh, we had a whole front page of the mail online, uh, mail, Daily Mail newspaper, which was kind of suggesting just eat yogurt and you, you're cured of diabetes, you'll never get diabetes. So I think we have to be careful in causal inference and how we interpret and put this in a wider context. So this is my last slide and I want to uh, uh, obviously uh, point out that we need to understand mechanisms. Work that we're very interested in is to understand the dietary behaviors to move from research to practice. Just because we come and give talks and show that uh, we have good studies that, that, that show that yogurt or dairy products are inversely related with chronic disease outcomes doesn't mean the population adopts that. Uh, we have a center in Cambridge on, uh, which is called the Center of Diet and Activity Research, and there we are specifically studying the barriers and facilitators of dietary intakes with my colleagues. Uh, we have to place them in wider context, as I said, and the final point really is that currently uh, most of the uh, dietary guidelines do allude to dairy products as a whole, but I think perhaps we now need to start moving into subtypes uh, of uh, dairy. And I'll leave you with that last slide uh, to acknowledge my colleagues without whom this work would not have been possible. Thank you very much for your attention. So um, we do have time for a question or two. I'm Nita, Andrew Prentice here. Um, this is tremendous work, and I'd really like to congratulate you and your colleagues and just mention it's a shame that Sheila Bingham, who designed all those dietary surveys, isn't alive and able to see some of the, the results that are coming from this. Now, I find this very, very compelling evidence, and what you haven't done at the end there is go back to your, your early slides where you and propagate up what an effect, a 28% reduction in diabetes would be between the turtiles even. You know, we're not talking extremes yeah. of ranges here. Yeah. This is potentially a, a, a very important effect. What I'd like to draw out for you, if I may, is that although you, you had on the one hand the Daily Mail uh, saying that, you know, yogurt would save the world. Right. You did, and I'm sure you're aware of it, have a, a counter view from NHS Choices, yes. which accused you of not having proven the thing. And what it, so the question I have is, um, one of their criticisms was that your um, recording of the exposure, seven days dietary intakes so many years ago, was not adequate. But surely I'm right in suggesting that that would tend towards a null result. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right. That would tend to attenuate the associations rather than uh, falsely inflate them. This is a common problem. The entire body of research that I showed you with those four separate systematic reviews is based on the food frequency questionnaire measured once pretty much largely, except for a couple of American cohorts as we know the nurses health study where there were some repeat measures. But largely it's based on a single FFQ. So moving on to the diary is a huge leap forward. We have lots of research currently ongoing in my group and we are beginning to look at repeat measures. And we're also trying to combine approaches of the food frequency questionnaire together with the diary plus biomarkers. And I think that will be very strong indeed to do so. So this is not at all a finished piece of work. This is just a little taster and other things are to come. <laughs>